Most of us think about the idea of a hunter-gatherer, and again, coming back to this idea that most in the kind of paleo fitness sphere recommend play, primal play, all these kinds of things, you know, very kind of unstructured, social type physical activity. Studies that have looked at hunter-gatherer populations do indicate that they do engage in a lot of play, but not play as we would think about it, or certainly not play as in is recommended from these uh, paleo fitness guys. So when you look at play, you tend to see that the children engage in a lot of physical activity type play, running around the playground, the types of things you see kids doing in the schoolyard, playground, schoolyard, and doing it again, Americanisms. But when you look at the adults, the play they engage in is more sat around, chatting, cracking jokes, you know, playing pranks, being creative. It's not physical activity play, it's play in spirit. So, do we necessarily need to be structuring exercise around this concept of play when even hunter-gatherers' own adult physical activity patterns aren't structured around this idea of, well, unstructured play activity? Now, as I said, they did engage in a lot of random walking patterns, but what we typically see is most of that occurs around the camp, the hut. Some of it occurs when they go out foraging or hunting, but most of it occurs around the home, for use of a better word. Now, out of interest, I've actually been using a pedometer myself recently, and it's interesting the number of steps I actually take just walking around the house each day. Sometimes before I leave for work, I sometimes accrue 2,000 steps just from walking room to room, picking things up, into the kitchen, make a coffee, into the bathroom, brush my teeth, whatever. You know, we do spend a lot of time walking around the house, and that's typically where we accrue most of our walking-type physical activity. It's surprising how much we actually accrue. And the same applies for hunter-gatherers as well. Most of their walking is just around the camp, around the campsite, around the huts, so on and so forth. Running, did they run? Well, we've got some evidence of persistence hunting, but then we've got other populations where the researchers have never seen a single person in the tribe running. So it's difficult to say we should be running Maybe we should, I don't know, we can, but should we be doing it? I mean, if hunter-gatherers don't do it if they don't need to, should we be going out and racking up miles and miles around the block each day? I don't know. Obviously, we do typically get some kind of sexual division of labor in terms of the types of activities that men and women are engaged in. But again, that doesn't mean we should take those ideas and say, right, the men, for your exercise, you should be chopping wood. The women, you should be making nets and baskets and those kinds of things. In terms of exercise size, we don't necessarily need to be making that type of distinction. Okay, so to kind of wrap up some of the things that might be affecting these physical activity patterns though, typically one of the issues when we're looking at extant, or extant hunter-gatherer populations is that modernization may have affected these types of things. But actually, interestingly, when you look at the studies that have actually assessed the degree of modernization's effect on physical activity patterns, i.e. by looking at education status, employment status in uh, hunter-gatherer populations that have been influenced by Western populations, you see that it doesn't seem to actually affect their physical activity levels that much at all. And I wonder whether that's maybe because actually they're not that much different from ours in the first place. Now, obviously the physical activity levels and patterns that we see in hunter-gatherers are gonna be affected by occupation duration, habitat quality, hunting, that type of thing as well, logistical mobility, you know, their actual geography. And we saw the same thing when we were looking at the extinct hunter-gatherer remains as well. But what I think is really important is the fact that although we see these divergent physical activity patterns between different populations, I think the focus on energy expenditure or physical activity levels as they're calculated is inappropriate because although we see similar physical activity patterns, we get drastic differences in terms of the actual physical activity uh, patterns, the modes of exercise and the types of uh, activities that they're actually engaged in. So again, I just think it's inappropriate to use them to actually draw exercise recommendations. Okay, so what can we conclude from this short review of this evidence? In essence, there is no one ancestral physical activity pattern. So how can we draw a generalized recommendation for exercise from it? We can't. It's very, very difficult to differentiate between what is an adaptation, i.e. an evolutionary adaptation to enhance reproductive success, something that affects our physical capacity, and whether that has determined whether we engage in a physical activity or whether engaging in a physical activity has produced said physical adaptation. It's very, very difficult to draw out those relationships and look at the direction of them as well. I mean, even studies have found that there's very low to moderate and certainly inconsistent relationships between the actual physical activity levels that populations engage in and their actual physical fitness. 
And that's looking at physical activity levels in terms of total energy expenditure relative to uh, resting metabolic rate. So looking at it from this energy expenditure perspective, as I said. It's also difficult to determine whether or not our physical activity levels changed because we got smarter or we got smarter and thus changed our physical activity levels. Certainly in terms of endurance exercise, there's the argument that the two kind of went hand in hand, our ability to endurance run, our ability to engage in these types of activities like persistence hunting that's been argued. Now, I thought Skylar was going to give the same talk he was giving at AHS as well, where he talked about resistance training and its effect on the brain. So he's not, I've learned. So I would urge you to go and look at his talk on YouTube as well, because he discusses the effects that even strength type exercise and resistance type exercise can have on the brain as well. And it's difficult to determine the relationship between the two. When we look at extinct hunter-gatherers, it's impossible to determine what their physical activity pattern was. And even when we look at extinct hunter-gatherers, there's drastic differences. But I do think there are some interpopulation similarities that we can draw from and then try and synthesise with what modern exercise physiology suggests. OK. There we go. So these are the current evolutionary fitness recommendations. From the most recent academic articles on the topic, from James O'Keefe and colleagues, including Lauren Cordain. So they generally tend to focus more on a low, high volume of low intensity, low to moderate intensity activity. And you see this 6 to 16 kilometers a day range that typically comes up that's been plugged out from one or two studies or so. They undulate high intensity activity with that low intensity activity. And there are other things that focus on the types and modes of exercise as well. So lots of walking, running, using uneven surfaces, barefoot exercise, this type of thing, including interval training sessions, resistance training sessions, and so on and so forth. But when you read through the specifics of these recommendations, they tend to be very romanticized and focus on a caveman-type workout. So in terms of resistance training, maybe we should be out flipping tires or picking up rocks or banging a hammer on tires and these types of things that you see in a lot of the CrossFit workouts and that sort of thing. OK, so what I want to do then is actually take some of the recent research from modern exercise physiology and see what elements of the evolutionary fitness recommendations can be supported and what can't, and what we can finally conclude in terms of some sort of you know, rational, sober set of recommendations regarding all of this evidence. So the question we're asking is, do the recommendations that have been made actually agree with what modern exercise physiology suggests? Do the recommendations that have been pulled from this review of the literature actually tie up with what we know from modern exercise physiology is best for improving cardiovascular fitness, strength, and hypertrophy. These physical fitness outcomes that we know are very well correlated with all-cause mortality, health, and well-being. Now, the current public health guidelines are obviously very focused on volume of exercise, and they've come under heavy criticism, as I said at the start, because what we're starting to see is actually the intensity of effort involved in the exercise seems to be the more important <coughs> component. So, if we recall, all of those fit physical fitness measures seem to be more associated with reductions in all-cause mortality. And that higher intensity of effort ex uh, physical activity seems to be more associated with it also. So what I think is we've been at fault focusing on this end of the spectrum in terms of exercise uh, intensity of effort. And what we should have been focusing on is this end. The brief high intensity type activity that seems to be far more supportive in terms of reducing all-cause mortality and morbidity. So we should have been focusing on the fact that actually hunter-gatherers typically engage in this, whereas previously we've been focusing more on the fact that they're more active, not the fact that actually they engage in some high-quality and high-intensity of effort activity. So what does the modern exercise physiology say about this? So in terms of cardiovascular fitness, there is growing evidence that intensity of exercise seems to be very important for it. We've all heard of high-intensity interval training. The research seems to continually support that high-intensity interval type training can actually improve cardiovascular fitness as much, if not more, than typical endurance type activity. It may not even be necessary to actually engage in interval type training or overcomplicate the program because one study has shown that actually single sprint type exercise maximally produces the same type of benefits as the interval training sessions do. So do we even need to overcomplicate it for cardiovascular fitness? <laughs> 
The same seems to apply in terms of strength and hypertrophy as well. Consistently, the one variable that seems to be shown to be very important is the intensity of effort, so how hard you're actually training. All the other variables might matter to some degree, volume, frequency, the exercises you choose, and so on and so forth, but they pale in comparison to the effect that high intensity of effort exercise actually has on outcomes for strength and hypertrophy. Now, in terms of the recommendations for varying intensity and the frequency of exercise, there does seem to be some support for this idea of auto-regulating the uh, way in which you program your exercise. Periodization and varying exercise activity and that sort of thing seems to work better when it's actually individualised to the person and their context. So there's some support for that. And, shock horror as well, the mode of exercise doesn't even seem to be important and I'll touch on that briefly now. So, do we really need to be performing the same types of activities that hunter-gatherers typically engage in? Should we actually be emulating hunter-gatherers in terms of producing physical fitness outcomes? Now, skill versus fitness is something that's been discussed in the exercise physiology and strength and conditioning literature for a long time. And it's even debated within the studies looking at hunter-gatherer populations, particularly pertaining to hunting ability and that sort of thing. So there are some studies that show that fitness actually improves hunting ability, or at least is correlated with it. So upper body strength seems to predict hunting ability in certain populations. Strength significantly predicts archery accuracy in, hunt in hunter-gatherer populations that use bow and arrow. But we also see that practice seems to be more important for them. So although, yeah, those uh, uh, strength uh, and, uh, seems to be associated with hunting ability, we don't know what the direction of causality is there as well. But we also actually see that it's more likely that practice makes perfect in these populations. And for them, they need to engage in those activities for their survival. So do we really need to be emulating those activities when we don't need to be performing them for our daily survival? So... What I want to question is whether or not statements like machines are bad because they don't emulate natural movements is a valid statement or argument to make. As a counter, I would say my colleague James Fisher has shown that training your lumbar extensors in isolation using a very sophisticated modern machine actually improves deadlift performance. Deadlift, picking up something heavy from the floor, couldn't, be a more possi you know, couldn't possibly be a more primal natural movement pattern. But doing a very modern type of exercise seems to improve that just as much. So the argument that we should be actually emulating hunter-gatherer physical activity patterns, I think is a moot point. I don't think there's very uh, strong evidence for it. There's certainly very little evidence that engaging in those activities will actually transfer to other skills and motor abilities as well, as we've shown in recent review papers as well. So unless you actually somehow, for some reason, need to go out and pick up a bison, butcher it, hunt, whatever, all these sorts of things for your daily activities and uh, physical survival. I mean, does any of you guys live within a hunter-gatherer tribe? No. So do you, fi oh, Ben, of course, you know, there's always got to be one. <laughs> See me after class. So, uh, but this is my point. Unless you actually need to engage in those skills, you don't need to practice those skills. And this ties up with what modern exercise physiology is starting to show as well. That when we're looking at these physical fitness outcomes, the ones that seem to be very important in terms of reducing all-cause mortality and morbidity, modality doesn't even matter. I mean, recent work from us and something I gave a talk on at the 2012-21 convention in London shows that the resistance aerobic training dichotomy as it's typically presented, the idea that aerobic endurance type activity improves your cardiovascular fitness, but resistance training improves strength and hypertrophy, and the two don't provide you know, crossover benefits. We've started to show that actually that's a false dichotomy, because as long as resistance training intensity of effort is high enough, you see improvements in factors like VO2 max, running economy, and so on and so forth, typical cardiovascular fitness parameters. But interestingly as well, if endurance type exercise or typical endurance type modalities, like cycling, if that's performed to a high intensity of effort, then recent studies actually show that strength and hypertrophy improves from that as well, to just as much as traditional resistance training. So the idea that modality is even important is just a moot point as well. Your muscles don't know what they're actually contracting against. As long as they're contracting intensely enough, then the benefits seem to come.